Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers where we educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. A core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body. And if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Anat Baniel. Anat Baniel, founder of the Anat Baniel Method and Neuro Movement, is the author of the best selling book Move Into Life Neuro Movement for Lifelong Vitality and the highly acclaimed Kids Beyond Limits. Anat was trained as a clinical psychologist, dancer, and was a student, then a close professional associate of Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais for many years. Anat Baniel's work is at the forefront of movement science and the emerging brain plasticity field. Over the past 30 years, Anat has worked with athletes, musicians, and other high-performing adults as well as those suffering from back pain, injuries, and a wide range of other conditions. Together with the hundreds of practitioners she has trained worldwide, her work is renowned for breakthrough outcomes with children with special needs. This combination of clients led Anat to have profound insight as to how the brain learns and changes in powerful ways. She developed the Anat Baniel method that offers both the theory fully supported by current brain science and the practice, what she calls neuromovement. Today, Anat Baniel is world-renowned for the transformational outcomes her students experience and for training hundreds of practitioners to do the same. Uh, Anat, it's such an honor to have you on the show, and I'm, I'm really excited to chat about this subject. Thank you, Michael, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. Uh, and be you know be part of your community. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, one one of the things that we always learn is that you know the brain pretty much stays the same, and we we develop as as a child. We we get all our brain cells, and and then it just slowly deteriorates from from there. Uh, is is that from your experience? Is that the truth? Is that the case? Uh, actually, from my experience, it's exactly the opposite. With a caveat. I mean, it could be the truth, or it can be the truth, depends what you do with yourself throughout your life. And that is basically what my work is about. You can live your life in a way where pretty much the brain just loses connections and you get more and more limited and more and more kind of deeply ingrained in habits. Or you can live your life in a way where you keep growing and learning and the, because the brain... Uh, is the most responsive organ in our body to our experiences. And it really changes all the time. The question is whether we're going to provide it with the conditions to, to grow, to change in terms of creating new connections and new possibilities, or it's going to be deterioration, loss of connections and more deeply grooved habits. There's this term called neuroplasticity that I know you talk a lot about. What What is that, and what does that mean? Well, neuroplasticity basically means uh, uh, that the brain uh, uh, can continue doing what it has done from the beginning, which is uh, uh, create new connections between the brain cells and, uh, and create what, uh, uh, can be called neural networks. That means patterns that allow us to do and be who we are. And because the brain forms itself through experience, and a big part of it, in my understanding, is actually movement, what we do with movement, um, everybody's different because every person has a, a, a different, slightly different path than, than others. So how we think and what we believe and, and how we move and how we, this is the, we write, like our handwriting. and Everything is really actually unique, but we all grow through the same process. Neuroplasticity is the, the phenomena of how the brain grows and forms itself 
you know, from actually before birth, but certainly from birth on. And, and, and the opportunity that it gives us to intentionally guide ourselves and our brains towards greater health and towards greater, you know, well-being. Does that make sense, what I said? Absolutely. And, and what's, what's fascinating with that, because a lot of people think, you know, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm born with, and, uh, and I can't really change much to it or I have an injury uh, to the brain, and, and now I'm always going to be handicapped in that area. But if I'm hearing you right, you can actually then compensate. And because the brain is, is continually changing, continually creating new uh, networks, uh, you can then compensate for that and even make the brain function better even though you're getting older if you do it through the, the right kind of attention and awareness. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I, I we, because I, I train practitioners, so I now work with colleagues, you know, as a team and so on and so forth. But I've seen uh, and I've, I work and have worked with the uh, uh, cases with people that were really believed to have no, no, no choice, no, no hope. As a, as a child, with the first child I worked with the, a, a, and worked with her very long term, as she was diagnosed with global brain damage and was, uh, parents were told to put her away in an institution because she'll never, and fill in the blank, like never function, never learn to move, to think, to be part of society. And I've worked with her over a period of uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, in the beginning, a lot more intensely, and then as she grew older, she didn't need quite as much uh, input from me. But she, uh, this, uh, despite her very severe, uh, you know, condition, she learned to walk. She learned to talk. She finished high school. She has two advanced degrees from a MA degree from a. A, to good university, she got married. She runs a small business, uh, you know. So, and that that couldn't have been predicted, uh, you know, at the at the starting point. I started with her when she was 13 months old, uh, and it took her roughly nine years to learn to walk independently. Mm. But that was a very dramatic uh, example. Basically, in a certain way, she was my school. You know, she was my schooling because the parents kept bringing her back, and I kept working with her, and she kept changing and learning. And she had to overcome enormous challenges. But as she learned, her brain literally figured alternative ways to organize herself, to to put her body together, so to speak, so she could end up doing what we call walking. But she had to go through a, a process that was much more elaborate because of, you know, the, she had the severe brain deformity or has. I mean, anyway, so, so that is how it works. Now, you take a, a, anyone at any age, and it, you don't have to have a problem. You just have to be alive and breathe. And you put yourself in a process. You keep growing. You become more alert. You become more awake. You become more vital you become more intelligent that is that has been my experience and that has been as a result my passion so in, in essence you, you can't really look upon if you have a, a brain damage you can't really say that this is it and now this is you know all i can do you can really then change the brain to function at a much higher level really it, it seems like almost no matter what, I mean, you can always create changes that will improve your, your brain function. Absolutely. But it doesn't happen by itself. You know, it, it, it just knowing that it could happen doesn't make it happen. That's why for, for up until recently, everybody believed that as you get older, you have no choice but to deteriorate and to deteriorate pretty dramatically. And, and uh, uh, because when people just did what they did, the way they did it without knowing, like, you're a naturopath, even in terms of nutrition, in terms of, 
uh, working on belief systems in you know so many different aspects where we can get either very grooved in or continue growing so if we don't proactively uh, uh, invest in ourselves to continue growing we will deteriorate or if somebody has a stroke and they just do the tr you know the traditional try harder to use your hand or you, to walk somehow that's not going to get them very far it takes more sophistication, it takes more um, knowledge, but the knowledge is not complicated. You just have to know it and to apply it. Wonderful. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I'm here with Anat Baniel. She's the founder of the Anat Baniel Method and Neuro Movement. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Anat Baniel. She's the author of Move Into Life and also Kids Beyond Limits, both highly acclaimed. And uh, she created the method Anat Baniel movement, so, uh, method. So we, we've been talking a lot about that the brain can change and that you doesn't matter really where you're at. You know, there is a possibility to change, but just the knowledge that it can change obviously doesn't change anything. You you have to apply very specific methods, and and in your case, you're then using movement to change the brain. So tell me a little bit how how does that work? Uh, well, uh, I say that movement is the language of the brain. Uh, in other words. A, a, the brain is basically an information system. So the body that we are aware of and that we feel is a, operates like a mechanical system, right? It has weights and it has muscles and it's like levers and you, you can feel if you go uphill, it's harder to walk than if you go flat on a flat surface. So we're very familiar with that. The brain is an information system, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. But And, and the question is, uh, uh, what is the source of information for the brain? And, of course, part of the source or an, uh, an important uh, necessary part of the source is the stimulation, right? The, the senses, the ears, the eyes, and, 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 and including also the kinesthetic sense. That's the, what we sense as we move. And, and the, the most of the activity of the brain in waking hours, uh, the brunt of it is really busy with organizing movement. That means, you know, getting all the sensations in and organizing movement. So if we look at the beginning of life when a baby is born in the beginning they have random movements you know they don't move intentionally yet it hasn't been formed within a human uh, being and and gradually they start sorting out the brain starts uh, creating those connections we talked about and the thing that is so important to understand is that the source of information for the brain is its ability to perceive differences. And I'm not, if you talk to neuroscientists, they'll say, but of course. <laughs> but if you talk to normal people, eh, or people who are not neuroscientists, um, it sounds bizarre. I mean, it's like, what? Eh, but if you think about it, if I don't perceive the difference between, let's say, the color red and yellow, I won't have the color red or yellow in my consciousness. If I go out on the street and it's a very bright day and somebody, uh, you know, turns on a flashlight behind me, I won't notice the flashlight. I won't notice that there's an added intensity to the light, uh, you know, I'm in. But if it's dark and somebody turns on the flashlight, I would see it instantaneously. And if I didn't expect it, I might get startled, right? So, so the movement generates constant change for the system. And we are built to have to manage our parts. That means through lots and lots of different experiences and permutations, we gradually hone in on where to put the hand when we want to push something away or where to put our leg to be able to bear weight and so on. And I found out 
the, in my work that a, I can communicate with people's brains through movement in ways that literally wake the brain up. It gets it to be more awake, more active, and, and be more inclined to create new connections, to create new possibilities, to problem solve more effectively. And I think the good news, so I'm talking about working with a client, right? I can do that with someone else, and I've done it, and my people have trained to do it effectively, very effectively with people. But what I really also like about what I'm saying to you is that you can do it for yourself. You don't have to have someone else do it for you or with you. It's something you can apply yourself, and that's the essentials. So movement is the language of the brain. Like Einstein said, until something move, moves, nothing happens. My teacher, Feldenkrais, said, without movement, life is unthinkable. Uh, Daniel Walpert, a well-known in, a neuroscientist uh, in uh, Cambridge, you know, claims that the only reason we have brains is to organize intentional complex movement. You know, and it's a whole science that is developing very, very quickly. It, you know, the whole, the relationship between movement and the brain. So, mo I wouldn't know how to, to, to facilitate change or growth for people if I didn't have the movement part. But I have movement is a very expanded concept. So it's not just exercise or like the thought of like moving my arm up and down five times or so on. Thinking is a form of movement. When you, when you think about thinking, when you have a thought, you know, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's a conclusion. There's an end to it, right? It sort of organizes itself into something that you can make sense of, right, that is comprehensible. And I know you just told me before we started talking that you, you spoke at Autism One, and one of the things that I observed working with children on the spectrum oftentimes is that they start forming, they start talking and forming a thought, and the sentence disintegrates. They can't bring it to conclusion. They can't, the movement gets disrupted along the way. They don't know how to keep it going. So that's the powerful movement. And, and I'd like to maybe say, okay, I don't know if you want to ask something before I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love it. I love it. I mean, what, what I'm fascinated about, because we're so used that the brain always guides everything, and, and that, that is kind of the, the higher power. But what, what you're saying is that there, there are signals going in both directions, where you know, using the movement and intentional movement uh, and very specific movements can then stimulate certain areas of the brain to then repair it and restore function. So the, the signaling then goes both ways, you know, in addition to then the brain, you know, obviously organizing the complex movements, uh, like, like you said, um, and then also, but then using movement to signal to the brain and then using then all these different kind of sensory, uh, like auditory, you know, visual, uh, uh, touch, feel, all these kind of things. So with that then, you know, in school, for instance, we are dealing with children that are, they're, the way they're learning is that they're sitting still and looking straight forward. And uh, do you feel that that is the optimum way for the brain to develop? Or do you feel that because of that, people are having more and more issues in regards to learning disabilities? Uh, I, I won't even touch right away learning disabilities, but putting children sitting um, a, and asking them to not move because it's disruptive and then asking them to learn math or a, a, anything else a, is really unfortunate. Um, a, I'll get <laughs> we couldn't... If, you know, I, I won't go into, I can go into, you know, two hours just to answer your question, this one question. <laughs> uh, we are, I mean, there's so much behind it. And that doesn't mean that kids can't stay, sit for a little while and focus on something in front of them. But the, the uh, how, what's the word, you know, the deprivation of movement, you know, that so, and the, 
attempt uh, to, to, or the belief that in order to learn, the body has to be still, is just incredibly mistaken. And uh, uh, we are just, uh, on tomorrow, no, the day after tomorrow, I'm flying back to Canada with some of my colleagues. We are starting a program, a pilot program in two schools out of six schools in the district, uh, or they call it division in Canada, uh, where we're, in, we're implementing, uh, first of all, I, I, last week we did a four-day training for the aides and for the teachers and, you know, the programmers of the, uh, how to implement the nine essentials, you know, of my, my method, uh, into how they teach and how they interact with children and also children that are, you know, have special needs and schools have more and more of that, you know, the... In, you know, autism and ADHD, and I know you know that, and CP and so on, and undiagnosed developmental delays, and it's really quite quite overwhelming for the schools and the classrooms and the teachers who don't have tools to deal with it. Um, but what the, the second phase, which is next week, is we are implementing a short, roughly seven to uh, roughly seven to nine minute movement lessons that are pre-recorded and they're animated. You know, that, so there's an animated figure doing the movement, the instructions that uh, I I created. This and it'll go the first period, the first things. That means when they come to school and sit down, they'll do this movement, and then after lunch break, another one of those. We have right now 39 different ones, so we can, you know, recycle them uh, every few weeks. And um, and the I call them brain pops because it's not only you see people think about content when they think about learning, right? So you want to, somebody to learn to do certain gymnastics or you want them to learn to figure out addition in math or how to speak a, a, a different language and so on. And, and that requires is the, the quote-unquote father of neuroplasticity science, Michael Merzenich, who has become a close friend, um, says the machinery. He calls it the machinery of the, of the brain has to work well enough, right? So it, 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 we learn the best we can. What I discovered in my work is that by using the essentials combined with movement, we, we actually upgrade the quality, the ability, the underlying ability of the brain to learn. So whatever you introduce to it, it learns it easier and better. And when you said like earlier in the interview, you know, some people say, oh, I'm not good at that. Well, first of all, they learned that they're not good because the way they were taught or trying to learn it did not work for them. So we need to find a better way because most brains can learn pretty much most anything, at least up to a degree. So, so, um, the, the, in, so in the school, we're implementing those movement lessons and we're attaching it to research. To, we actually, we're IRBing it into research to compare it to two equivalent schools in the district, they are not going to get it for the first year. And a, a similar thing has been done in Israel, just in math class, in one math class over a period of two years. And it, it's not an, on a research, it wasn't done as a research, so it's not like a research quote, but a, a anecdotally, the kids in that class, a, are doing much better in math, but they're doing actually much better in everything. And that is because when you upgrade the quality of the function of the brain, it does better on anything. So yes, kids need to, to, to move in school, but there's also a way to potentiate the movement by combining it with the essential. That's amazing. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, you're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Anat Baniel. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Anat Banyal. She is the 
founder of the Anat Baniel Method and Neuro Movement. So, you know, one of the things is that um, a, a friend of a friend, you know, his, his name is uh, Dr. Ranko Rajovic, and he uh, started a school called Nikola Tesla Center, or a, a kind of a learning, uh, you know, learning school. And one of the big things that uh, he's really recognizing and goes right along with what, what you're doing is that we are falling uh, further and further behind in functional knowledge. And the biggest reason is because we are uh, limiting movement. We, you know, children are not running around in the forest anymore. Uh, they're not uh, jumping jump ropes uh, and during recess. They, uh, they're, you know, glued to their devices, they're sitting home, they're, everything is just lack of movement. And because of that, uh, because of that lack of stimulation, you're then decreasing the amount of neural connections uh, between brain cells and you know, between uh, neurons. And uh, so we are decreasing our ability then to learn. And uh, he also mentioned that you know, just the kind of repetitious knowledge like we do at school only uses about 5% of the brain. So what, what you're doing is, is really revolutionizing and at the same time then is pushing us in a direction uh, that becomes, you know, this can then become a solution from the issues that we're dealing with. Like you we were talking about autism, how uh, that is truly, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more of an issue. And I think in addition to obviously we have many factors, vaccination, EMF and lack of nutrition and infections and toxins and all of these come together. But to be able then to utilize then a tool such as movement, uh, it, it's, it's crucial. It's crucial in combining that in our uh, educational system. I, I think that is key. Uh, so I'm really thrilled that you're doing something like that. Thank you. So I'm too. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So it, <laughs> it's, it's, a, I tell you, it's heavy lifting. I mean, in introducing uh, the concepts, which I believe we're probably going to get into, of the essentials and, and another concept that goes with it, the teachers, it's, it's different. It's not difficult. It's difficult because it's new, because it's foreign. And uh, so it's a transition in, in uh, the belief system of what potentiates, what works well, what makes things work, right? So, yeah. So what what are the, the nine essentials? I mean, I, I know I, I, those, those are kind of becoming the core foundation of your method. Uh, what, what are they and, and how can people use them? Uh, how can that impact their health, you know, their well-being? Um, is it user friendly? What 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 are the nine essentials, and how can they be used? Okay, so as I said in an earlier segment uh, of the interview, that the brain gets its information uh, through perception of differences. So it's not a and when the brain uh, perceives differences, it does what's called differentiation. From a physical point of view, differentiation is the creation of new connections, uh, uh, creating more uh, dense maps in the brain that connect the brain and the body in many different configurations. And it's very holistic, right? The brain has to account to, for the whole body all the time. So, so uh, the nine essentials are basically uh, mechanisms that uh, intensify and facilitate for the brain sort of supercharge the brain's ability to perceive differences. And 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 I'm also close friends with, I'm sure you know her name at least, Jill Balti taylor And she she's taken my, uh, my training, and she's a huge fan because she says that what I do, I, I, I my essentials describe what her mother did for her to recover and what she did for herself to recover. So... So, and before I go into the essentials, there's one thing that is a complete attitudinal and belief system shift, and that is moving from the idea of fixing either someone else or oneself to connecting with. So when I work with a child, for example, or an adult, doesn't matter, 
I have to, to discover where they're at right now, what they can do in the here and now. So I may, I may want for them to be able to do things they can't do right now, but that doesn't mean that they can get there. They have to get there from where they are. And the differentiation, the learning, the progression of creating more and more options always builds on where we are now. If you think of it biologically, of a, 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 a conception, after conception, the cells start dividing, and they have to divide enough in order to start separate, creating different kinds of cells and then creating different kinds of shapes. The same thing happens with learning, even though we don't see it or we can't touch it directly. And it's a huge, huge shift in, 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 in uh, approach to oneself or to the other. Because let's say, for example, if you have a child that, uh, you know, if you take autism, that is screaming or doing stuff, I'm not talking about immediate destructive things that have to be blocked, you know, somehow. But they, they're they doing what they're doing. They can't do something else at that moment, and very often they don't even know what they're doing. So it's, it sort of comes out of them. So, and, and if we take just a healthy adult that wants to become more fit, for example, you know, the place to start to enhance your fitness is where you are. And then the question is, how do we go about it? So in a way, it's a form of connection, of love, of accept, I don't know, acceptance or not trying to change anybody, but looking to create a process where spontaneously things will form themselves. Nobody can make the body grow. <laughs> we can just create conditions that optimize or increase the the probability that it'll happen and happen well. So the first essential is movement with attention. So we spoke about movement, and movement is fantastic, you know, and doing movement and walking and hiking, and I, I love to move, you know, and hike and so on. And then there is movement that we do on purpose while we pay attention to what we feel as we move. So I'm moving. I can I can be doing an exercise, or I can be making a coffee, or I can be getting into my car, and I just take a few seconds at a time, or a few minutes at a time, and as I move, I pay attention to what I feel, because first of all, movement is change. So you, we can look to follow to gauge the sensations that come along with our movement. There is research that shows, it's again, it's a Mike Marzenek research that shows, a, a, it's a, one of his early research studies where he discovered that the brain continues changing, is that movement without attention, there was no detectable change in the density of connections in the, between the brain and the area that was moving. And when a, a, he, they did the study so the monkeys paid attention to their movement and to what they were feeling. It was very cleverly done. There was massive changes. The clearly detectable increase in density of connections associated both in the sensory cortex and the motor cortex area. And I have seen it now for over 30 years. I mean, it's amazing how powerful movement coupled with attention to what you feel as you move, it's remarkable. And that, since we always move, even if somebody's bedridden, they still move. They move their eyes, their eyelids, they breathe, you know, they might move their arms a bit, maybe roll to line one side and then another, put a pillow under their head. You, you just go where you are and you start paying attention to what you move, what you, what you feel as you move. And if you're somebody that can move freely or goes to the gym, you'll see it goes together. Oops. It goes, go, I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, it, you, you can slow down a bit what you do and pay attention to what you feel. And then you just go back to doing it more automatically and you'll feel a breakthrough, a change. I've worked with top athletes, top dancers, you know, musicians. It's remarkable how powerful it is. So that is the first essential.
And we're going to take a, a quick little break because um, I... <laughs> The, these nine essentials are so powerful and, and the difference, like you're saying, moving, but then also moving with attention and then also slowing down the movement to connect that movement with attention, with feeling, you know, what, what, what a difference that does in, in brain development. Uh, you're listening to Helpmate Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Anat Baniel. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I am Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Anat Baniel. She is the founder of the Anat Baniel movement and method. And uh, it is a is it a technique that actually helps to change the way your brain functions and also helps to repair brain function. And so that's why it's such an, an amazing thing that that it does. And for People dealing with like autism, uh, any kind of uh, neurodevelopment issues, uh, this becomes really crucial. But also for high performers like athletes, you know, she's been working with a lot of athletes. So we're going through the nine different essentials. We went through the first one with movement with attention. What and what what comes after that, Anna? Okay, and the, the attention is not, is to list what you feel as you move. Most people think you have you pay attention to the instructions and then you try to do the movement correctly, but people actually try to skip the infusion of the feeling of, because that's what creates the brain change. The, the, there's other group of research studies that show that when we do movement with attention to what we feel, there's roughly 1.8 million new connections per second. There's about a billion roughly a minute, a little under a billion a minute. That's the speed of structuring of the brain. That's amazing. When we do that. Yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's, yeah, it's quantum. It's a quantum system. It's an information system. So let's approach it like one. The, and by the way, it's extremely helpful with pain, you know, with Parkinson's, with, uh, uh, you know, injuries, recovery. I mean, because it helps the brain reconfigure how to manage the body in a way that it works better for us. In our thinking. Well, because the, okay, yeah, the, yeah, the pain is in essence just a misfiring of, of nerves. You know, so if, if you then reconstruct how those nerves fire and how they communicate, you can then resolve the pain. And like, I mean, like you, and I know in the, some of your material, you're talking about people that are not able to move very freely. And it's because the brain is not aware of certain muscles that exist there. So then, you know, you, you, you talk about this differentiation between this muscle versus that muscle. So the brain starts to realize that, ah, I got I get muscles there that I can use and activate. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so the second essential is slow. And uh, fast, we can only do what we already know. That's how the brain is built. You know, the, the, when we do learn something new... A, a, it takes a while as we repeat it to myelinate, that to insulate it so the, the, the signal can fire accurately and quickly. So, so if we want to do something different than what we are doing or something that we've never done before, you know, or differently, we actually have to slow down. And then we want to, to move it to also fast. Right, and it actually gets relegated to the automatic uh, part in the brain rather than the learning part. But in the learning process, slow is essential. And and so often people think they can't learn or they're not smart or they're not talented in a certain area just because they try to do something fast before they the, the, before there was a the differentiation, <laughs> before the organization to do it was formed. So slowing down is extremely extremely important and and of course you combine it with movement with attention and you got yourself like a really powerful uh, communication and uh, with your brain the next essential is a, a i call it subtlety and subtlety is basically a reduction of force of effort of intensity of stimulation and what that does is just what i talked before about bright light versus the, you know, dark. When they, in order to perceive, uh, uh, when the stimulation uh, is intense, 
uh, if we do movement with a lot of force and effort, or if we uh, have very loud sound or very intense light, the ability to feel a change in that flow of stimulation is greatly reduced. It's actually a logarithmic uh, equation. It's called the Weber-Fechner law. It's a known neurophysiological phenomena. So if if I am, let's say, working with you, and I want you, I want to awaken your ability, intelligence, and ability to learn. I'm going to slow you down, and I'm going to guide you to reduce the effort. Because then your brain can start noticing changes, or what I call differences, or some, you know, in neuroscience it's called the um, signal-to-noise ratio. And then you start feeling stuff, and you start noticing stuff, and your brain starts creating connection, and you're learning. And it's very counterintuitive because we're, you know, we're not paying no gain and try harder and go faster and, and repeat a million times. And, but that is kind of like industrial age consciousness we we have so much more knowledge now and we can use ourselves and and relate to others in ways that awaken our well-being and our intelligence so that's the next essential shall i go to the next one yes i I would love that yeah because that i mean that's it's crucial to understand how you can then connect movement to uh, working on your brain because we all need a better brain Yeah, yeah, and but and we move all the time. You you do it gentler, you do it slower. You pay attention to what you feel, then you do it faster. Then you, do, and the next one that goes right there with it is variation. One of the things that I, I worked with a lot, a lot of musicians and top-notch musicians early on in my career, and and I saw that you know even the very very good ones had a lot of trouble and a lot of the you know, repetitive injuries and all this stuff. And I realized that, and I was taught also to play, you know, an instrument. So the way very often a child is taught to play an instrument is very rigid. It's like put your fingers here and hold your elbows here and do this and and trying to narrow, just like what you talked about, the Nikola Tesla Center Learning thing. Yes, and I'm going to Google it. Once I'm off the call with you, I mean, <laughs> and once I'm off the other call, comes afterwards. So, so what happens is, the you are starving the brain from information. If you look again at a little infant, a newborn that has no voluntary movement, zero. What does the body do? All kinds of random movements and twitches and reflexes. That, by the way, there's a very books that are sold to a lot of parents who try to accelerate their children's development that calls it useless random movement. And without those movements, nothing will ever happen. Children that for some reason don't have those randomized movements in the beginning of life never learn to move, and their brain never grows as it should. So it's, and, but the movement is, is not the right movement. There are millions of of permutations, I'm so sorry, there are millions of permutations that um, it happen before we, we create a recognizable, useful movement like crawling or like grasping or uh, millions and millions of, of experimentations. And so what I figured out when I worked with musicians, rather than try to correct them, because I could see some of the time what they were doing uh, wrong, so to speak, but um, uh, but the the uh, I couldn't correct them because they had no path there. I mean, they had the information was missing. It's like trying to tell you know uh, telling me to fly. I can't fly. It doesn't matter how hard I try. So what I started doing with the musicians, I started telling them to play in different wrong ways, to do things wrongly, and two things happened: the pain. The information, whatever was going on, disappeared, and the quality of the production of music, the quality of the outcome of the music was just so much better. And I'm talking about world-famous classical musicians. So I do that with everybody. I mean, it's like the easiest thing. You want to do something better in your gym or in your yoga or just 
just do it in different ways. Do it in ways that you think are not the right way. Do it gently so you don't hurt yourself. And then go back to doing it. And no matter what, you will improve how you perform. Because the brain is getting its food. It's getting information. Variation is very easy to do. And, and really, I call it my cheap essential. Like really easy to get out of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, and and that's it. Like you're saying that the the brain only recognizes you know differentiation. So if, if it's kind of like they they did a test where they had a a cat in a white room, and because there was no changes, everything was white. You know, the cat grew blind, and uh, that happened within a day. So uh, it wow, just, I, I'm not aware of that research. It's just yeah, it, yeah. it is really fascinating. So and and with that also, can you? Can you bring up a point in regards to uh, neural connections that are not used? What happens with them? Oh, they, they, they dissipate over time. It, what happens is you lose differentiation. So it's, it's a, uh, there, there, there are ways to, to disrupt, to actually create trouble, to bring about pain or, or you know, and that many diseases actually what you have is you have the loss of differentiation and sometimes for example again musicians because of the way they practice if they over practice over repeat try to do it too very fast they can get a, a, you know where they lose control they get spasticity in the fingers and they lose control of one or more fingers and it's a very, very big, and they have now done research on the brain, and they show that the brain really goes weird. You know, there are presentation of where the hands are, maybe the foot is there. I mean, the whole image of self in the brain it, it really get, gets trouble, into big trouble. So, so uh, it's just like the cat. I mean, we as humans can harm the brain. Um, so it's important to continue differentiating the self and that brings the bottom line is get us a lot more vital and vitality is intimately associated with usefulness and usefulness is associated with differentiation so we call it the circle here and and that's I think, and that's why I, yeah. I think is is so crucial that we try like you're doing with the musicians that they try to every possible wrong way but all those wrong ways then develop all these new neural connections that makes the brain more well-rounded, and then you you don't lose function. Yeah, because if you just you, do you the don't same, you not lose function. You improve function. Exactly. You see, the, the brain is a, the brain optimizes itself all the time. If you didn't optimize itself, we will never learn and improve. I mean, there's something in biology that selects the thing that works better. It's just we have to give it an opportunity to discover the better. Uh, there is a there is a, a a bias towards the better. Otherwise, nobody. I don't think people would survive more than a short period of time, right? I, I mean, if, so so anyway. So and and I think we probably won't have time to do all the essentials. But what I would like to talk about is maybe a, a very briefly. So an, another essential is enthusiasm. And enthusiasm is a, 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 the willingness it, it, to be delighted with what you might judge as a small change. Because when you amplify, when you tell your brain, oh, that's great, I couldn't do this, but now I'm doing it a little differently or I can do it, and it might be feel still a long way from where you want to go. The brain grooves in success. Success is very important for success. And we are, it's up to us to decide what's successful. And many, many people, both towards themselves or towards ourselves or towards others, are actually a bit stingy. And it's not until you do it perfectly or far enough or fast enough, am I going to clap and think you're, you've succeeded? And that's a huge mistake, and that's one of the big, big shifts in the way I work. And with children with special needs, it's very, very dramatic because they don't know what they're supposed to do. Many of them don't know why everybody's fussing and so upset around them. But, but they know they're failing. They know they're disappointing. And if the adults around the child 
not, not g- g- pretending, but truly developing appreciation to the mir- miracle of shift, the miracle of change, that, and do it to, towards oneself. Another one is flexible goals. Having goals is important. However, how we get to the goal, we need to really open it up. People think or people go somewhere and they're told, that's how you get to the goal. Well, if we knew how to get to the goal, guess what? We would have been there already. So a true goal is we don't know how to get there. Yeah. And okay. so it's, again, it's a shift in an approach and a willingness to move in all directions while we're awake and aware and, 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 and you know, progress. Yeah, so, and, it's, so it's almost seems like an intention, awareness, and then also being flexible, doing it slower, and and trying, not just trying one specific way, because there's not always just a right way, even though the, the brain kind of prefers the easiest way or the, the quickest route, but then to create a whole spectrum of, of different possibilities, and, and that is what the brain will really be stimulated by. Uh, Anat, it's, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, and I, I really urge all the listeners to uh, to check out the Anat Baniel method uh, because it, it is fascinating, the, the work that you're doing, and I truly appreciate that you exist and that you're teaching others to, uh, uh, to continue your work. So thank you so much, Anat. Thank you so much, Michael, for making it possible for people like me to speak what we know and bring it out to the world. I really, really appreciate it. Well, truly my pleasure. Uh, that is it for today. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Remember, check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it.